Welcome back to the show, everybody. Check out these headlines we got for you. We got Ethgate. We got him in communications revealed. Clayton and Gensler connection here. SEC's Hester Purse is speaking out about the comment that she had on Twitter. You're going to want it. We got Charles Hoskinson in the news. Liechtenstein's largest bank in crypto. EU and the digital euro. Ripple partner announcement. And we're going to talk about this. 130% breakout possibly for XRP. Somebody roll that beautiful intro. Digital Perspectives with Brad Kimes. Come on in. Welcome back to the show, everybody. You can follow me on Twitter at Dig Perspectives at the top of the screen and also at Digital Perspectives, no spaces on TikTok. We got highlight reels coming out there every day now. Make sure you tune into that. We're going to grow that uh, that page and that profile a lot very quickly. Lots of action happening. We're also going to discuss today very quickly how Ripple can get clarity before the case ends don't believe it. It's still true. $1.840 trillion market cap, ladies and gentlemen. Happy May 4th. May the 4th be with you. It's, it's Star Wars Day. Bitcoin, 38800 plus. Ethereum is 2800 plus. Number six spot is XRP at $0.61. Cents. The range of price very quickly. $0.60 cents on the bottom, 62 almost 63 on the top. We'll keep an eye on it, ladies and gentlemen. I trust capital. The only thing better than buying crypto is buying tax-free crypto at my house, not financial advice. But when I start thinking about retirement in my life, I start thinking about images of comfort. Yes, I want to be able to know that I've got funds in a portfolio that looks nice to me at the time of retirement that I can tap into and it be tax-free when I do. Link underneath the video. Right here, we're going to talk about this first. This is really the ties of communication between Jay Clayton's time at the SEC and Gary Gensler meeting with him. And this is obviously not really in the beginning here. We're looking at the transition team from Gary Gensler to from uh, uh, Jay Clayton, which is very, very normal protocol. But, you know, what you have to, to, to really see here is when you go beyond the transition period between administrations of Clayton and Gensler, and that's, a, like I said, a very normal transition period. But you go all the way back to March of 2018, Gary Gensler being at the MIT at the time teaching with extreme clarity, the way he teaches that class. And somehow, by the time he gets the badge at the SEC, he's got all this vagueness. Well, I'll tell you what, this isn't very vague right here. This is a minute, 27 seconds of communications really spoken out here. And I'm going to go through them uh, just to be very quick with it. It's between uh, Joshua Ford, Bonnie, and uh, Bill Hinman, right, from the SEC. And it is really them discussing their conflict of interest with these ad hoc meetings because Simpson Thacker was going to be there. And they're really trying to come up with ways that they can have him in the room. And they also talk about Sullivan Cromwell with uh, Jay Clayton as well being a conflict and how they can get around these conflicts. And it really just goes to show that they were well aware of what their private business was and how it was affecting their public chair and position at the SEC. No question about it. Just like there's no question about this, ladies and gentlemen, this is Hester Peirce, and she is talking in this video clip about her tweet that she had, which is right here, where she says the SEC is a regulatory agency with an enforcement division, not an enforcement agency. Why are we leading with enforcement in crypto? This was a tweet she put underneath of the SEC Gary Gensler's post saying they doubled the forces to go after crypto. That's what we're talking about here. Listen to this uh, really, I guess, about a minute clip here. Take a listen. Enforcement division, not an enforcement agency. Uh, joining us now to sort of tease us out a bit further is SEC Commissioner Hester Peirce. Welcome, Hester. Hi, Emily. It's great to be here. Great to have you back. So, Commissioner Peirce, let's, um, you know, as we know, a tweet, you know, 
speaks volumes, but I'm sure we could tease this out a little bit further. So let's let's just talk about what is it about this news that caused you to make this statement? Yeah, I mean, like, what does this actually mean? So they're adding some new jobs. Is this just kind of like a symbolic action? Like, OK, look, we're taking this seriously. Or do you actually think that these new jobs will lead to much stricter enforcement from the SEC? Plenty to do on the in the crypto space. We all know there's there's plenty of fraud out there. We can spend resources on that and have expenses on that. And I've supported that. What objected to is that we haven't set out a regulatory framework. And so we're, we're cart before the horse. We're getting ready to enforce along all these lines without telling people what those are. And so that was really my reaction. I mean, having an enforcement um, team that's dedicated to this area is fine, but where's the regulatory team that's dedicated to this area? I've been calling for this for a really long time, and I've yet to see it materialize. And that is the truth. And and it does beg the question. The question now is, OK, Gary, you've hired this new army of lawyers to go after crypto and enforce crypto or crypto regulations from the SEC's agency. But how do they know who to go after? Is it because they're to go after everyone? Because that's what you're letter looked like yesterday that is for sure this is charles hoskinson pointing out in this very quick clip here well it's not going to take long to get this one about 30 seconds here he's going to tell you that things like ethereum aren't scalable (laughs) if you're not aware charles hoskinson a co-founder of ethereum before creating cardano and uh, Bitcoin talk and these things. But uh, back in those days, uh, we were just trying to solve the problem of email for money. So we just wanted to be able to send value to people uh, easily and without counterparty risk. And then what happened is people said, well, that's a great idea, but we want programmability. It's kind of like when JavaScript came to the web browser, then you got Facebook and YouTube and Amazon, all these rich experiences. So in 2013, I helped co-found Ethereum. And there we had smart contracts. And then suddenly we could do uh, crowd sales and we could do NFTs and DEXs and all these things that you see today that are very exciting. Uh, but the problem with those technologies is they don't really scale. Uh- oh, there you go. They don't really scale from the co-founder of the Ethereum network. We've even played video on this channel where Vitalik Buterin and Joseph Lubin have said the same exact thing. You have to wonder with this new army from the SEC, which is why I'm showing it to you in this manner, You have to wonder, will they go after finally Ethereum and bring some accountability to that project, which has disguised whale investors, which obviously also has some very serious tech issues outside of ETHgate? Now, here's a quick clip that I want to play for you here where Charles Hoskins in about 40 seconds tells you, What's going on with the world wanting to move to a new transnational or transinternational system? I think it says transnational system of money and assets, which I really refer to as a multipolar asset backed system that the IMF talks about a lot. Listen to what he says here. Well, that's an interesting question. So we have seen a global trend where uh, the status of the dollar as the world reserve currency, because we print so much money and because of recent political events, uh, it has diminished quite a bit. But it's not like what happened when the British went to the American standard, where it would go from the U.S. to the Chinese standard. There's a global desire to move to a transnational standard that's not controlled by just one nation. Mm -hmm. Uh, And nobody really wants, in the Western world, the Chinese standard to replace us. So blockchain is another example of a compromise solution. If you can't have another empire take over, can you have a transnational framework which is decentralized and no one actor has control over it that has fair rules for everybody and everybody's treated equally and no one can be left out of that order? That is, I believe, to some shape or form where we're headed. Right now, I don't believe that the U.S. is going to give up those reins so quickly, which is why I also remind you of this fact right here. I want to show you very quickly, which is this right here. Let's not forget that Ripple itself, the company owns 5.9 billion coins, XRP tokens, but the escrow 
is not owned by them. They are the steward of the release every month when it comes out, right? And remember, if we're talking about moving to a transnational system or framework like a G7, G20 style that's dealing with this impl Im implementation of protocols like the XRP Ledger, maybe Cardano as well, and, and, and Stellar Network and maybe a few others, you know, you have to say to yourself, you know, what becomes of... Of this escrow, right? And I think the easiest way to do that for the U.S. to see a transition of moving away from a global reserve currency like the dollar and still being able to be very relevant in that move to a new financial system, you see Ripple deemed or RippleNet deemed systemically important and then held to a heightened prudential of supervision by prudential regulators like the Treasury. And then we don't have to worry about what happens to the escrow because basically the Treasury and the Fed will oversee it. That's how I see that. Lechtenstein's LGT Bank is part of the LGT Group, the largest family-owned private banking asset management group in the world, and announced that they're now offering direct investments into crypto. Now, this is all going in coordinates with them and the SEBA Bank from Switzerland. And if you read through this article, which I, I did, you don't have to, let you know they're starting with Ethereum and Bitcoin right now, but I'm sure that they will expand the services for digital assets as it develops. But Lechtenstein has been really a, a first mover when it comes to not just crypto assets, but regulation as well. Dr. Martin Heisboik, who has been making a lot of waves and attention in crypto Twitter space, and he is the head of Uphold's blockchain and crypto research. He says the latest presentation of European Union's ambitious digital euro project hints that the user anonymity is not a desirable option. Oh, have we talked about this, right? And this is a reminder here that the, however, the overall mood of the document about the digital euro dollar is basically can be expressed in a single quote from slide four, which goes, user anonymity Anonymity is not a desirable feature at this point. <laughs> Hansen concludes, it isn't clear how exactly the digital euro would differ from the existing fiat-based infrastructure digital payments. Well, I tell you, I give you, I give you a quick little look. Let's see if I'm wrong. I'll make the video if I am. They're going to be able to see all your transactions and eventually be able to institute negative interest rates on your bank account and your funds. Yeah. How about that one? Do, 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 do. We'll see if I got the spidey senses right on that as, as uh, future will tell us here as time plays out. Right here, this is an announcement from Ripple Partner here. Finestra announces the launch of Finestra Managed Services. Don't sleep on this. Amazon Web Services to enable banks and financial institutions to access the Finestra Managed Services in the AWS cloud. It just keeps getting bigger, right? And again, all of this is really tied back to being able to have the ledger work as a decentralized exchange for which it is, for which eventually all the liquidity of the world from every different sector is tied into it. This is a quick reminder right here. Ripple has partnered with several central banks around the world, as we covered from Brad Garlinghouse here, and announced that some not yet announced. And that's exactly right. I'm not going to play the clip again, but that's exactly what Brad Garlinghouse said. And it means there's more coming when the banks are ready to tell us that there's more coming. The Ripple private ledger, which is the XRP ledger, and they made a private ledger for the central banks, is being used. And now we're going to move into the discussion of how Ripple can get clarity before this case ends. This here is a reminder from Digital Asset Investor. For, uh, for, what, uh, for your information, Ripple Markets Wyoming is still live. Same state that gave both Avanti, now Custodia, and Kraken a special purpose depository institution SPDI charter. This is where Ripple is filed under Ripple Markets right here. And it was 12-3-21, and we see that it is still active today. This here is 3-7-22, ladies and gentlemen. Head on a swivel out here, because I believe, I really do believe, 
that once this lawsuit is over with the SEC versus Ripple, there will be only a digital, the only digital asset with clarity will be XRP. And how can XRP not take the number one spot for market cap with that being a real reality? This is what I like to call the ripple squeeze play, because the best way to not be denied in this world is to be undeniable. Ripple's 95% customers outside the U.S. turn on the use or turn up the use of on-demand liquidity and XRP, driving price becoming even more undeniable as a bridge currency, not just to the U.S., but to the world. This is... I believe is when you heard Brad Garlinghouse on Fox just last week say, you know, I be, or it was Bloomberg, you know, I believe we're acting as if we've already lost the case in the U.S. Well, by building 95% of their customer base on the other side of the world, outside the U.S., you can do exactly something like this that says, you know what, you may be trying to deny me. But me and the Ripple partners and customers around the world are about to show you something that is extremely undeniable, and it is XRP working in real time as a bridge currency, for which it is doing right now. And that can really bring an obvious truth that is so undeniable that maybe the U.S. Treasury has to step in and deem it systemically important. Maybe this case ends in a settlement. Maybe we do go the distance to 2023 in summary judgment. I don't know. I don't pretend to know. But what I do know is, is when you have this many countries that you have clarity on what XRP is, you can absolutely start to drive liquidity and utility through it at a stronger and faster pace that they're already doing today. And then that is going to have to force an obvious reaction from the United States, no matter what the SEC thinks of XRP. And with that, we look right here. We see XRP hints at a buy signal. Is there a 130% breakout on the cards? It says here, considering the bullish outlook for crypto markets at the time of the writing, there is a good chance XRP price could bounce from the lower trend line and retest the upper trend line if investors make a risky move by accumulating now. The total run-up would constitute 128% ascent to reach its target of $1.40. Not financial advice from me or anyone else, but that's where we are on this day. Check out all the links in the description box and the comment section. Do not forget, Link2 is running a promotion right now. If you buy private equity from Link2.com, from Ripple, or any other, you will get XRP back in your wallet on Uphold. Don't mess around. And if you're not accredited, go register with Link2 because you will be one day. And here's the other good news. You'll get access to so many data points and information on all the blockchain crypto companies in this space. And who doesn't want that? I'll catch you on the next one.